All right, great. So uh, I hope uh, Kelsey didn't use up all the good luck because we're going to do a couple demos too. And I'm pretty sure based on that that he took every bit of luck that's uh, available in this room. So um, you guys can't hear me? I'm sorry. I talk really quietly except all the other times. So uh, my name's Clayton Coleman. Uh, I work at uh, Red Hat. I work on the OpenShift team. Uh, Derek uh, Carr is on the team as well with us. I'm sure there's a lot of people in here who have no idea what the heck OpenShift is. Um, it's platform as a service. If you don't know what platform as a service is, it's the thing that everybody loves to hate on because it tries to simplify everything that people go do to make it easy to actually roll stuff out in the real world. So I'm going to start this by saying something you know, really inflammatory, but it's not actually true. I just put it in there because you're supposed to do that in lightning talks. So when people talk about PaaS, everybody I don't know, can't say what I really think about this, but a lot of people complain about PaaS. They say, PaaS is too hard, PaaS doesn't give me any power. I can do the simple things, but then as soon as I hit the limit on that, it's all over. So OpenShift 2 is out there, has been out there for a while. OpenShift 1 was around. It was a very simple PaaS model. You push source code, stuff gets rolled out. You do a lot of web apps. But let's be honest, what Kelsey showed, what we all know is that that's not the real world, right? The real world is big, complex apps. Um, and it, you always start off simple and small. And then sooner or later, somebody's like, well, you know, what we really need is this really complicated thing that this vendor is selling us. Or we hear about this awesome framework, but it takes like 18 different services to run. And it works great, but it's big and it's complex. And it doesn't always do what we want. When we looked at Kubernetes about nine months ago, um, it was really obvious to us that the Google guys had the right abstraction in place. Like, it's about applications. Like, everything's about applications no matter what you have. It's about running sets of components to talk to each other over the network, like that's an application. It doesn't matter what it does. It doesn't matter whether it's HTTP or TCP or the most insane, crazy message bus that you can possibly imagine. And so when we looked at this, we said, okay, well, if the Google guys are going to get the bottom level right, how do we come in and make it easy to be on top of Kubernetes and to do the things that you need to deliver source code and deliver software on top of that? into the cluster. So Kelsey showed you an application, but you know, the next question is, is well, what if I just want to push source code and have it be deployed? So Derek's going to start a demo here, and he's going to show you kind of the basics of OpenShift, and then we'll dig into some of the details about it as we go. So this is very bleeding edge. It is live, and I hope it works. So what I will show you is right now, the next version of OpenShift, you can run in two modes. Um, as Clayton mentioned, we're heavily contributing to the lower level part of Kubernetes to meet our needs. And so we actually will support a, an operational mode of you start OpenShift and we embed a Kubernetes cluster for you. Uh, but we have a secondary use case where you have an existing Kubernetes cluster, you're using it, you're happy with it, but we want to provide OpenShift capabilities on top of it. And so that's what I want to show you today, which is if you have a Kubernetes cluster, how do I run OpenShift as a pod on top of it? And then how can OpenShift interface with the lower level Kubernetes cluster to actually start to provide pads like capabilities on top? So I have a cluster here. It's running in the, in the Vagrant environment, so hopefully it's happy. If it has no pods, just so you guys know I'm not faking, and I'm running on head, I am using cube control and not cube config. So uh, right now I'm in the default namespace of Kubernetes. Kubernetes provides me two service endpoints that I can use to talk back to uh, the actual API server. And so what I want to do now, and in the interest of time, I'm going to run a shell script um, that will uh, create a pod that will run OpenShift v3. That pod will have a reference to a secret that tells how to speak back to the Kubernetes master. And uh, it will expose two services that tell you how to talk to the OpenShift API and the OpenShift UI. So like that, it's done. And so if we go and look at um, my cluster again, you should see that I am running a pod called OpenShift, and it is running. So life is good. So let's go look at it, because one of the things that we are doing in OpenShift is not hiding the fact that we are running on top of Kubernetes. And we're not trying to hide those primitives because we think they're powerful. And so now, I'll go to the OpenShift UI, which is now running on top of Kubernetes. And I'll accept some certificates. OK. So 
you are now running OpenShift Origin on Kubernetes, on head. It is exposing the lower level primitives in Kubernetes. So if you use Kubernetes today, you know there's a default namespace. It holds your stuff. Uh, we're using namespaces as a way to segment uh, the PaaS infrastructure to provide projects. Uh, but it's kind of neat to just, if you wanted to go see what's in the default Kubernetes namespace, you can go look at it. You got a Kubernetes service, you got a Kubernetes read-only service, you have the origin API service that's bound to the origin pod, it's speaking over 8443, 8444. And so actually as an administrator of OpenShift, you can actually use Kubernetes and see it you know, verbatim. But what I want to do next is show as, a, as an end user of the PaaS, how I can go and create new namespaces and new projects and start to actually deploy and, and work with code. So what I will do now is... I don't get to talk, okay. Um, what, while Derek's doing this, what's really important is like we're running applications on top of Kubernetes because Kubernetes is an application platform. This is like step one, right? So Kelsey showed a Postgres app. Kubernetes is an application, right? Yeah. At some point, we want to show the Kubernetes infrastructure running on top of the software. Like these are things that make it easier to run real applications, and that's as important to us as you know making like the simple toy apps that people can throw together and show. We want to make real things work. So OpenShift will take your code, it'll build images for you, and push them into some registry, and then we will deploy it for you. In the sake of interest in this demo, I'm going to run a private registry on my Kubernetes cluster. And so I'm now creating a Docker registry. It's uh, exposed as a service endpoint on Kubernetes as a pod. If I go back and look at my pods, you should see there's a new pod there called Docker registry. Uh, and so let's start actually doing PaaS-like capabilities on top of Kubernetes. So what I want to do now is create a sample project. And uh, just in case everybody realizes, like what Derek's showing are these scripts that make it like easy for him to I'll demo. I'll through it, yeah. Yeah, there's commands underneath it that are doing all these same things. They're just the same commands. Like each of these scripts has like two commands in it, but so, know, we only had 10 minutes, so. Yes, I don't want to be, uh... okay. So what I just did in the background here is I created a new namespace, which is going to be a project in OpenShift. And in my actual project selector here, uh, outside of the out-of-the-box stuff, you will see you have a now a new endpoint. It is your new OpenShift 3 sample app that you're running on Kubernetes. It is a project. You can start to assign in, in OpenShift roles for how users can interact with that project. You can assign quota constraints to say, this is how many resources this individual Kubernetes namespace can use. You can assign limits that say, uh, no given container in this namespace can use more than this amount of CPU or less than this amount of memory. So for example, here is that sample creation flow. If I go and look at my project settings, you, know, you can see, okay, this is your new project. It's actually a Kubernetes namespace. It is having some limits. It says, you can only run 10 pods in this project, X number of replication controllers, et cetera. And there's a background daemon in the process that's tracking what you're using. So yeah, next and it's, step. You know, a big thing about PaaS is people want to split up the resources they have to share it with people. So like the first question you say is, I've got this cluster with all these fungible resources. So what are the tools that let me share those among 10,000 people? And one of those is this project concept, but access control and quota all fit into that. Yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, so the next part of the demo is, uh, in the interest of time, I see I have a clock here out of a minute and 18 seconds. So uh, you have code. That code lives somewhere. You want to translate that code into an image, and you want to deploy it, and you want things to change. When you push changes to your code, you want to see those changes happen to your running uh, instance. So what I will do now is, and I'm glad I wrote shell scripts for this, is create what's called a deployment. And one of the concepts we have in OpenShift on top of Kubernetes is we have a concept of an application template, which is Kubernetes has the ideas of pods, replication controllers, services, uh, you know, those base resources. Uh, and so we have this concept of an application template, which is how do I take everything that's in a Kubernetes namespace today, extract it out, and stamp it so it's reusable to build other types of applications. So we have a core template. You can process that template and parameterize it to do what you need. Yep, and everything in that template is just Kubernetes stuff. So the command line for Kubernetes can spit out a whole bunch of stuff. And this is just a slight variation on top of this. So again, this is just Kubernetes with things on top of it. It's, not, so it's nothing new. So if I go back in my project, what just happened there is I said, oh, I, I have an application template I want to run in this namespace. Uh, the first thing that's in my application, we have a, a Ruby front end app that's speaking to a MySQL database in the background. Uh, I went and created the database. It is now running. And what I want to do is simulate the idea that, hey, I've just pushed a new change to my Ruby app up to GitHub. 
Uh, and because I have a limited Wi-Fi scenario here, I'm going to simulate the fact that GitHub just sent me a trigger back that said, hey, the code changed. Go build something. Uh, so what you can do is then go create a manual build. Yeah, there's a really cool start build command that you yeah. can't see because it's in a shell script. But Well, that's fine. So they just started a build, uh, and the build is now uh, accepted as a job into Kubernetes. So when you actually go and run builds in the system, it's actually using lower level Kubernetes primitives. So you'll actually see if you want to browse your project, you see I'm running my database pod, but now I'm also running a build pod. And we have a concept in OpenShift around source to images. Uh, and so this is actually this canonical builder that's running. It's actually running as a pod in your system. And this build should hopefully finish. Yeah, and this is just a simple example, but imagine if you wanted to run 18,000 variations of the same build. If you have Kubernetes and you have 1,000 nodes, you can run 18,000 copies of the builds just as easily as you could run one. So like replication controllers on builds and those concepts yes. coming down the road. So I don't think I have enough time to watch the build finish. The build's actually running in the background. It's going to do a Docker push of the output of this build into a new image in my image repository that I created <laughs> earlier. And ideally, then the deployment for your app would recognize that, hey, there's now been a new build push to this registry. Push out your new code and roll it out in a rolling update style fashion like um, Kelsey just showed previously. So main takeaway here is OpenShift is heavily working on Kubernetes primitives. We're not hiding them. So if you like the power of Kubernetes, you will see that power in OpenShift. Yeah, and you can, um, uh, all the OpenShift team works, uh, we're in the Google containers, um, IRC channel a lot. But you know, our goal is to help make Kubernetes everything that we need to run applications. And it's the things like storage and limits and quota and access control. These are the things that we want to get involved to help build on top of Kubernetes so that everybody benefits uh, from that. So if you could get the last slide. So we're out of time. But um, you know, if you want to check out the source code for OpenShift, if you want to try it out in a Docker container, run it all inside a Docker container, run a whole cube environment inside a container, give it a spin, you can uh, see our GitHub page and check it out. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.